History has shown us that the greatness of any country is sometimes measured by the size and strength of its military power. In history books, little attention is given to the important role African Americans played in the armed forces, but research will show that African Americans fought with honor and distinction in all of this country's wars. African Americans eagerly volunteered to participate, hoping that sacrifices on the battlefield would equal full civil rights in civilian life. For much of American history, African Americans were frozen into one position. No matter what happened in the larger society, they remained slaves. In fact, the first recognition that African Americans might bear some resemblance to human beings came from the slave owners when they were anxious to increase their own representation in the U.S. Congress by forcing a provision into the Constitution counting each slave as three-fifths of a person. Even after the abolition of slavery, African Americans were in a peculiar position, citizens without full rights, and this unequal status followed them into the armed forces. African American soldiers have repeatedly gone off to war to defend a society which has excluded them from its benefits. African Americans saw participation in the armed forces as a way of fighting two battles, home front racism and America's enemies abroad. In every American war, African American soldiers have paid a price in flesh and blood for a dream that remains denied. <laughs> What gets my goat? What gives me pain? Bricks up my crown, fills me with shame. Heats up my blood, drives me insane. No, my brothers, they don't treat the same. And I'm all wound up and I'm all tied down. Balled mm -hmm. up inside and spinning all around. Mm -hmm. My pain is deep, my hurt is so wide. Mm -hmm. I hear you crying, freedom, but freedom is denied. Love is the battlefield. I'm The major wars that the U.S. has been involved in look like this. The American Revolution, 1775, 1781. The War of 1812, 1812 to 1815. The Civil War, 1861 to 1865. Spanish-American War, 1898 to 1899. The Philippine War, 1899 to 1902. World War I, 1916 to 1918. World War II, 1941, 1945. The Korean Conflict, 1950, 1953. Vietnam Conflict, 
1966 to 1974. Crispus Attucks, fugitive slave and black seaman, was the first to shed blood and die in the revolution that freed America from British rule. He was killed by British troops in the Boston Massacre. Black Minutemen took up arms against Great Britain in the battles of Lexington and Concord, and two outstanding heroes of the Battle of Bunker Hill were ex-slaves Peter Salem and Salem Poor. In the early days of the Revolutionary War, blacks were not welcome in the Revolutionary Army. And when General Washington took command, he issued an order instructing recruiters not to enlist Negroes. The idea of recruiting and arming blacks, whether slave or free, raised fears of slave revolts. But when the British offered freedom to blacks who would fight for the crown, the Americans did the same thing. In fact, provisions were made by the government to pay the slave owners $1,000, while the freed slave would receive $50 at the end of his enlistment. Of the 300,000 soldiers who served in the Continental Army, about 5,000 were African Americans. Some volunteered, others drafted. In addition to several all-black companies, an all-black regiment was recruited from Rhode Island, which distinguished itself in the Battle of Rhode Island. There was hardly a major battle between 1778 and 1781 that was without African-American participants. In fact, two African-Americans, Prince Whipple and Oliver Cromwell, crossed the Delaware with Washington on Christmas Day, 1771. Despite the contributions of African Americans to the winning of American independence, the New Republic withheld freedom from the vast majority of its African American population. And with the end of the war, many African Americans had lost their lives. Some won recognition and a place in history. Few had gained their freedom, but most have and will forever remain anonymous. In the War of 1812, African Americans fought the British on land and sea. Originally, Captain Oliver H. Perry, who commanded the battles on the Great Lakes, objected to the assignment of blacks to his ships. But after the Battle of Lake Erie, he praised them highly. The War of 1812 forced the New York legislature to raise two regiments of black soldiers for its area. And two battalions of black soldiers were mobilized for the New Orleans area as well. On September 21, 1812, three months before the Battle of New Orleans, General Andrew Jackson called upon free blacks of Louisiana and in his appeal confessed that the policy of the United States in barring blacks from the service had been a mistake. When the Civil War began, African Americans were not allowed to fight in the Union Army. President Lincoln's administration contended that the war was between white men and had nothing to do with blacks, slave or free. All this changed in July 1862 when heavy losses, increasing desertions, dwindling enlistments, and bitter defeats by rebel units forced Congress to authorize the use of African-American troops. But there was no follow-up until January 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. The North could only win the war by destroying the slave base of the Confederate States, and the Emancipation Proclamation was the catalyst for a Southern defeat. Another reason for the Emancipation Proclamation was to discourage Great Britain from aiding the Southern Confederacy. After the Emancipation Proclamation, the War Department moved quickly to enlist African Americans, and the first two officially authorized black units came in January 1863 from Massachusetts. The role of the African American in the Union Navy was paramount as well. In September 1861, suffering from a shortage of manpower, the Navy adopted a policy of signing up escaped slaves as well as free blacks. When the Civil War ended and the need for black support had diminished, black soldiers found that they had achieved the legal status of free men, and the 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution had given them the legal rights of citizenship. Unfortunately, the government reneged on its promise of 40 acres and a mule, and African Americans found that they had exchanged legal slavery for economic slavery and that the fight for liberty was in the final analysis no more than a fight for re-enslavement. In 1866, the Army was reorganized and put on a peacetime basis. In recognition for valor, six black regiments were established by law as a part of the regular Army. Four of the regiments, the 24th and the 25th Infantry, 
and the 9th and 10th Cavalry were organized as permanent army units and stationed west of the Mississippi River. Most of the officers of these units were white, though. General John Pershing, who was white, earned the nickname Black Jack because of his service with black soldiers. Between 1870 and 1900, the 9th and 10th Cavalry were the central units in the campaign to win the West. Because of their toughness and coarse hair, they were feared by the Indians who called them Buffalo Soldiers. When the Spanish-American War began, African-American enlistments were high, plus racial oppression from and before the Civil War was very overt. For that reason, many blacks saw joining in the war against Spain as an ideal chance to again prove their right to citizenship and equality. When the battleship Maine blew up, there were at least 30 blacks on board, and 23 of them were killed. In addition to the four black outfits in the regular army, several states, including southern ones, changed their hostility towards black volunteers and permitted them to organize outfits and enter the service. At first, all these outfits were denied the right to have black officers, but a campaign around the slogan, no officers, no fight, succeeded in winning some concessions. Eventually, 100 officers were commissioned in the volunteer units, and in Cuba, black soldiers saw action and won high praise. And many claimed that the black 9th and 10th Cavalry came to the aid of Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders and saved them from complete annihilation. When U.S. forces ended Spanish resistance in Cuba and Puerto Rico, they turned their attention towards the Philippine Islands. In the Philippine Islands, an independent movement had already been fighting the Spanish. But when the Filipinos turned against the United States because the Americans showed opposition to Philippine independence, the U.S. sent 70,000 U.S. troops to battle them. Most black soldiers saw considerable identification with the non-white Filipinos, an identification that was heightened by the fact that white soldiers generally referred to both black troops as niggers. Opposition to the war by blacks became so loud that by 1899, the War Department thought about whether it would be wise to send any black troops at all. The question was finally resolved, and all four regular Army black regiments saw action in the war. Black troops increasingly felt that they were being used in an unjust war and that they were in part responsible for the racism against Filipinos that they could see spreading with American control. At the start of the 20th century, the military was one of America's most segregated institutions. Black soldiers were totally barred from the Marines, and in the Navy, they served in only the menial positions. Only the Army permitted blacks to serve in every branch except the elite pilot section of the Aviation Corps. Black soldiers faced hostile and aggressive white mobs whenever they left their posts, and when they tried to assert their basic rights as human beings and American citizens, they became victimized. Two cases of mass punishment of black soldiers in 1906 and 1917 illustrated how the Army resorted to wholesale victimization of black soldiers. With the tightening of racial lines, black doughboys had to once again fight for the right to die on an equal basis with whites in World War I. Racial discrimination at home and abroad reached new heights during World War I, and the government was emphasizing the subordinate status of black enlisted men and officers by restricting them to labor and service brigades. The extent to which government was willing to humiliate and degrade black troops can be seen in an official order from General Pershing's office on August 7, 1918, to the French allies. The memorandum stated in part, prevent the rise of any pronounced degree of intimacy between French officers and black officers. Do not eat with blacks, shake hands, or seek to meet with them outside of military service. Do not commend too highly black troops in the presence of white Americans. Meanwhile, President Wilson had transformed the nation's capital into the most segregated city outside of the Deep South, when colored restrooms were established in government office buildings. The lynching rate nationally climbed as high as two blacks a month, and President Wilson himself declared that World War I was a white man's war, even though he put up little resistance to accepting black troops. The first black battalion arrived in France in June 1917, and before the war was over, more than 50,000 blacks and 115 units made up more than one-third of the entire American forces in Europe. 
the most successful black units during the First World War were those attached to the French command. Of these four regiments, the 369th, 370th, 371st, and 372nd, three were awarded the French Medal of Honor. While the war was still going on, 96 blacks were lynched in 1917 and 1918, and black soldiers were now unwilling to allow the racists to attack them without fighting back. Claude McKay, a black poet of the post-war period, expressed the feelings of black soldiers when he wrote this poem. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. O oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe, Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. The year following the war, more than 70 black Americans were lynched, some of them returning soldiers still in uniform. America was still not ready to repay its debt to African Americans, despite the French honor that recognized blacks as having saved the most sacred cause, the liberty of the world. Between World War I and World War II, the Army remained segregated and adopted a policy of having a quota on black enlistment. During World War II, blacks entered the service in large numbers and were placed in segregated units. Blacks entered the Second World War with mixed emotions because they were going to defend the country where lynching had become so commonplace and so much an accepted part of American life that an anti-lynching bill could not be passed in Congress. Under the Selective Service Act of 1940, more than three million African Americans registered for the draft. And in 1942, about 370,000 entered the armed forces. In 1944, when the Army was at its peak strength, there were about 700,000 blacks in the Army, around 165,000 in the Navy, 5,000 in the Coast Guard, and 17,000 in the Marines, which started admitting blacks in 1942. In the course of the entire war, approximately one million African Americans served in the armed forces. All served in segregated units until the severe manpower shortage of 1945 forced the government to begin putting individual blacks into previously all-white units as replacements. Faced with rampant discrimination in employment, segregation in the armed forces, and demeaning personal discrimination, Blacks reacted to the war not simply as Americans, but as black Americans. When lynching broke out against black GIs trying to use the same facilities as their white counterparts, it was only natural that blacks should feel that they were involved in two wars at the same time, one against Hitler in Germany, the other against Hitler's in the U.S. The refusal of the government and armed forces to end official segregation was one of the conditions that most disturbed blacks during World War II. The tenacity with which the armed forces maintained segregation and the trouble it sometimes had to go through to coordinate the efforts of two separate armies, one white and one black, suggested to many blacks that the maintenance of segregation seemed more important to the army and the country than victory over the enemy abroad. As a result of the Battle of the Bulge, a drastic shortage of infantry replacements persuaded General Eisenhower that black troops should be allowed to volunteer as infantry for replacements in white companies. Despite this partial integration, World War II marked a point where blacks were no longer willing to accept discrimination without protest. The treatment of blacks in both military and civilian life during World War II became the turning point in American race relations from which the seeds of the protest movements of the 1950s and the 1960s were sown. In 1948, President Truman ordered full integration of the armed services. And by the time the Korean War broke out in 1950, military integration was universal in policy, but limited in practice. In 1951, there were still 200,000 blacks in 385 all-black units. In the course of the Korean War, the Army deactivated all-black units and assigned blacks to previously white units. But before this order went into effect, one all-black unit, the 24th, captured Yek An in the first U.S. victory of the war. And Private William H. Thomas, 
a unit member, became the first African American to win a Congressional Medal of Honor since the Spanish-American War. By the end of 1954, equal treatment had become official military policy. However, there remained constant reminders that equality of black soldiers was strictly limited to equality in the defense of American society and did not extend to participation as citizens. The growth of opposition to the war in Vietnam raised new questions about black participation in the military adventures of the U.S. government. The black soldier had new attitudes about their role in helping to achieve full civil and human rights. And they saw the war in Vietnam as a depletion of young black manhood that was unable to help in the healing of the troubles at home. The Vietnam War was probably more than any other single event in decades demonstrated to the black Americans that the reason for their lack of material progress was not so much this society's lack of financial and material resources to improve housing, education, and job opportunities as its lack of unwillingness to commit those resources to the uses. Many groups and leaders who deferred among themselves about how to win full human rights for African Americans did agree on the opposition to the Vietnam War. But the first black leader to speak out against African American involvement in Vietnam in such a way that really hit home for African Americans was Brother Malcolm X. This is our contribution, our blood. Not only did we give of our free labor, we gave of our blood. Every time he had a call to arms, we were the first ones in uniform. We died on every battlefield the white man had. We have made a greater sacrifice than anybody who's standing up in America today. We have made a greater contribution and have collected less. Have collected less. Long as the white man sent you to Korea, you bled. He sent you to Germany, you bled. He sent you to the South Pacific to fight the Japanese, you bled. You bleed for white people. But when it comes time to seeing your own churches being bombed and little black girls murdered, you haven't got no blood. You bleed when the white man says bleed. You bite when the white man says bite. And you bark when the white man says bark. I hate to say this about us, but it's true. How are you going to be nonviolent in Mississippi as violent as you were in Korea? How can you justify being nonviolent in Mississippi and Alabama when your churches are being bombed and your little girls are being murdered? And at the same time, you're going to get violent with Hitler and Tojo and somebody else that you don't even know. <laughs> if violence is wrong in America, violence is wrong abroad. If it's wrong to be violent, defending black women and black children and black babies and black men, then it's wrong for America to draft us and make us violent abroad in defense of her. In conclusion, history shows that white America generally restricted black participation in the armed forces until emergency situations forced the use of black manpower. And even as early as 1766, some blacks advised that it was inconsistent for them to fight for American independence while the country believed and practiced slavery. The black soldier will never forget who the real enemy is to African Americans. And military records will prove that the black soldier was and will always be ready to fight, willing to fight, and able to fight. I'm Jim Nelson. Thank you for watching. Sees the
ました。